God. Yeah. 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 Hallelujah. Man. I've waited so long to do that. It's, it's good. I have. Um, it's purdy. It's purdy. Yeah. You know, every once in a while, people ask me, what's all the skulls for? And I tell them, that's just to irritate religious people. I mean, when you see, you know, somebody who's not a Christian wearing a cross, do you, do you go, oh, there, oh, that's really, it's a skull. You got one, I got one. Now, whether yours is full or empty, I don't know. <laughs> Praise God. Um, just really quick, and then we'll move on. The Blessing of the Bike Sunday, for those of you who are visiting, has become a tradition where every Blessing of the Bike Sunday, I freak people out the first time I did it. Now it's kind of like old hat. Yeah, once a year, I ride my motorcycle in the church. Um, this one obviously is brand new. Um, it's taken about a year to build, and I did not build it. Um, I just paid for it. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, stack. Uh, Mark Calhoun, he built it uh, for nothing. He just graciously, as a gift, built it for me. Yeah. Woo! Pretty cool. So I, this has been a dream of mine since high school. I've always wanted a custom chopper. Um, it's, it's just like way cool. <laughs> what do you say? <laughs> I mean, if I have to explain it, you're not going to get it. <laughs> okay? Um, I can just tell you a couple things really quick about it. It's got a, you know, primary belt drive with a chain secondary because I'm tired of breaking belts. On my other bike, I'm always snapping the rear belt because I'm hard on parts. So we put a chain on there. I don't know why. It's got an Ultima 127 cubic inches for the engine. 127. Some of you go, so what does that mean? <laughs> well, obviously to you, nothing. <laughs> to those who care, that's over 2,060 cc's. You know, somebody says, somebody says, you know, I have a 900 or a 750, or they say I have an 1100 or an 1800. This thing's 2,060 cc's. It's got 140 horse. Where does Orlean sit? That is a great question. And that would not be on this bike. That is correct. My wife drives her own. In fact, since she got her, since she got her license, she does not ride with me very much at all. Um, this one here is probably strong enough to have anybody sit on it. Please don't. Um, anyway, so that's, that's it. Praise God. Hey, you know, for those of you who are visiting, or, and for those of you even regulars, it's been a while since we were in the series, because I've been gone for several weeks. I'm going to pick up a series that we are in called, entitled, The Church of Oz. Obviously, your bulletin cover is a great clue of where we're going. The Church of Oz. You know, we've taken this allegorical story, we're taking this story, making an allegory of it to the church. We're looking at... Four main characters in The Wizard of Oz. And I'm comparing them to the church because I remember some time ago watching The Wizard of Oz and drawing these parallels in my mind. The first character was, or yeah, was, we talked about already, was the Scarecrow. You know, the Scarecrow was a lot like the church. He's fun, lovable, uh, we have life. Jesus said, I've come that you might have a life and have it abundantly. And, and we really have this joyful relationship with the Lord. You know, the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and patience and kindness. It goes on. But oftentimes, the church, just like the scarecrow, needs a brain. We don't think through issues. The whole skull thing is just one of them. We're stuck in our, in our stereotypes of what we've always taught, been taught, like calling this the house of God. Friends, show me in Scripture where this says this is the house of God. But I see old Christians saying all the time, we're going to come into the house of God. In the house of God. Friends, this is not the house of God. If this is the house of God, God is broke. <laughs> I mean, uh, no, no offense, this is a nice building and we love it, but it's not fancy, it's not in any way, nor should it be. But this is not God's house. 
When we leave here, it's empty. Otherwise, you've got to walk up to the door and say, excuse me, is God home? No, the Bible teaches very clearly this is the house of God. And I have seen Christians over the years, unfortunately, not understanding, not thinking through issues in a greater way, ruin the house of God, people, out of defense for their inaccuracy, treating the, house, the building as the house of God. We're going to mess up the carpeting. This is the house of God. You should be ashamed of yourself. I didn't realize we were supposed to preserve it until he came back. <laughs> supposed to wear it out because of use. Not abuse. You know, the church is so much like the scarecrow. You need a brain. You've got to think. Tattoos. I, had, I can't tell you the number of times people look at me and they go, <gasps> You have tattoos. And I go, ah, you don't. <laughs> and I go, and I, I'm just messing with him because it's like, so what's the deal with tattoos? Well, the Bible says you shouldn't have any tattoos. I go, yes, it does. It also says I'm not supposed to trim the corners of my beard. But that didn't really bother you, did it? It's your inaccurate, non-thinking process of understanding the whole scripture verse, the whole verse in context. What is the meaning? But no, it's your tradition. You just kind of, you've been taught this, and you just parrot the same old stuff. You know, the church is a lot like the tin man. Tragically, we're a lot like the tin man. The tin man's got some good qualities. It's made of steel. That's why he's called the tin man. You know, the church has the strength of the tin man. The church has withstood centuries of persecution. It's a bulwark of truth, enduring down through the centuries, a standard against evil. But like the tin man, if we're not careful, we stand for all the right things, but we have to realize that we need a heart. You see, the tin man was strong, but he needed a heart. Jesus said, what would it gain for you to give the whole, you know, all your earthly possessions away? What would it gain if you, you know, prophesy, conquer the whole world? What would it gain if you do all that? But you have not love. You have the right theology? Yes. You have the right doctrine? Oh, you would never smoke, drink, or chew, chew or go with a girl who does or do. <laughs> Sounds better when you say do. Yeah, but, but you don't love people. You see, so far too often we're like the tin man. We have the bulwark of truth, but we need a heart. This morning, we're going to be introduced to the third character that the church is like, and that is the lion. Direct your attention to the screens.
you enjoy that? <laughs> Brought back memories. You know, a cowardly lion is an oxymoron. Two words trying to describe an item that are opposed to each other. An oxymoron. I think another oxymoron is a weak church. You know, I started looking through some of these, some oxymorons, and there's a bunch of them here, and I just, some of them are kind of interesting, a little pregnant. Uh, accidentally on purpose. <laughs> That's how most of us succeed. <laughs> um, act naturally. You like that? That's an oxymoron. Adult children. Advanced beginner, airfield, almost suddenly, alone together. How about this? I like this. How about Amish technology? <laughs> Amish, Amish, Amish technology. Yeah. How about this one here, too? Anonymous colleague. How about an anorexic pig? <laughs> you anorexic pig! Okay. Um, apparently invisible. Aqualand. What a lot of us are. Air, armchair athletes. There's an, there's an oxymoron. An armchair, armchair athlete. There, there's one listed here that I don't agree with, but it says it's an oxymoron, and that's an attentive husband. How about this one? Aunt Jemima Light. How about an authentic replica? Awfully good. Jumbo shrimp. The kind of pants a lot of us wear today, unfortunately, baggy tights. <laughs> oh, man. Um, God, there's just some there's just... Um, Bigger half? I want the bigger half. That's an oxymoron. That's so funny. Boneless ribs? <laughs> Clearly obscure. How about a clever fool? There's an oxymoron. Or how about this? Click start to shut down. Some of you will like this one. Some of you might not. But Clinton... Principles. <laughs> Oxymoron. Um, cold heat. <laughs> My wife said this is definitely an oxymoron. Because I read this, I said, honey, is this really an oxymoron? She says, absolutely. A comfortable bra. <laughs> Get rid of it then. <laughs> that was bad. <laughs> That was bad. <laughs> how, how, this, now some of you are really going to be offended by this one. I'm really sorry ahead of time. But this is an oxymoron. Country music. <laughs> uh, crash landing. Did we land or did we crash? I don't know. Uh, different similarities. The dotted line. How about this one? Dry lotion. Dry lotion? Man. How about an expert amateur? <laughs> oh, I think of Cliff Clavin. Explicitly ambiguous. Future history. Hmm. Giant dwarf. I don't think this is one either, but it says this is an oxymoron. And I mean, I think it's an oxymoron. I just, I'll just read it. A girly man. <laughs> good junk. Good junk. Good, good lawyer. <laughs> How about growing smaller? <laughs> Two more. How about, how about half naked? Either she's naked or she's half-dressed. I mean, 
Is the bra on? Is it? Uh, it's, but it's not comfortable. How about a happy pessimist? You know, friends, while all that is funny, and it is rather funny just to laugh at ourselves and just how silly sometimes things come out, the subject of looking at the lion is not funny at all. Because you see, the lion is supposed to be the king of the beast, and in the opening scene, he jumps out, and he's ferocious, and he's fierce. He says, I'll take you both on at the same time. I'll take you out with one hand behind my back, one foot. I'll even close my eyes. He sounds so tough. Dorothy comes out, whacks him on the nose, and we see what he's really made of. Tragically, I think that describes the church today. We make great boasts. How strong the church is. How courageous. I'd be willing to die for Jesus. Yeah, the problem is you're willing to die for him, but you're not willing to live for him. The lion has no natural enemy. And neither should the church. The church should be fearless. It should be powerful. It should be intimidating to the ungodly. But instead, in this day and age that we live in, the godless mock. Yea, they scorn us. The church. They're not afraid or intimidated by the church at all. The church is God's beloved. It's the bride of Christ. We say that we're full of the presence of God. Filled with the Spirit, endued with power from on high. In all things, we are more than conquerors. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And we kind of pump ourselves up and we realize that that's true. Until somebody says, are you one of those Christians? You're not one of those ignorant Christians, are you? You don't really believe there's a God today, do you? Are you that stupid? Where well, we worship man's intellect and man is going to be the solution of all things. <coughs> Far too often, the church is like the lion. It needs some courage. It needs some courage. Why don't you share your faith with your neighbors? Why do we remain silent when godlessness raises her voice? Why do we do nothing when we see evil prevailing? Oh, we, I take that back. I got to update just my whole thinking here. We do things. We go online and say how disappointed we are. Now we feel like we did something. When did the pressure of political correctness make us cower? Friends, we live in a world that's just, is going backwards so fast and we don't even realize it. When a soldier is killed in the line of duty, his family eventually gets a flag and a note conveying sympathy and respect from the United States government. But when a black pro basketball player announces he is gay, he immediately gets a personal phone call from the president congratulating him for his courage. Courage? Something's wrong. The church needs some courage. I want to read to you just a couple stories that hopefully will incite a spine in each one of us. In the Nuba Mountains in the Sudan, they've had a Christian population since the 6th century. Today they're littered with mass graves. Nuba women are systematically raped by Arab soldiers in order to produce non-Nuba offspring. There have been reports including from Catholic bishops of crucifixions of Christians by the army. Muslim troops from northern Sudan have sold tens of thousands of Christian children and women from the south into slavery. Many have been branded 
or mutilated to prevent escape. And many more have been tortured or starved, trying to convert them to Islam. In a China province, with a word I can't pronounce, the officers stripped three brethren naked from the waist and forced the women to stand with them. The three men were beaten until they were totally covered with blood and had gaping wounds and injuries all over their bodies. As if such violence wasn't enough, the officers then hung them up and began hitting them with rods on their backs. They did this until the three men were unconscious and barely breathing. What was their crime? Communicating with foreigners. In other words, witnessing. Talking about Jesus. In another area, local Muslim cleric, uh, were, clerics were working to drive 60 Christian families from the region. They demolished their church. The Christian men were beaten and the women were stripped naked while three girls were kidnapped and raped. There was a reporter from World Magazine that was interviewed, and he was over there in a dangerous, sensitive country and was back now reporting on it. He says, none of us likes to be humiliated and rejected. I want people to think well of me. You don't want people to think you're some kind of a religious nut or a fanatic or whatever. I think that's what stops us. But I'm reminded, I reminded my people a week ago that some of these people who were here marching down our aisles of our church with their flags, putting their lives in jeopardy. Their participation here, should news of it ever get back to their homelands, could actually get them killed. I'm not talking about the Middle Ages or the early church. I'm talking about this past year. One Christian leader was hung up by his hands and had this, his skin peeled off his body. Where did this happen, he was asked. It was in the Middle East, in one of the Islamic nations. They came down on a small church. They took the pastor and all the people to jail. They tortured everybody but the pastor and then let him go free as an object lesson to others. But before they showed him the door, they pulled his eyes out. With blood running down his cheeks, he left the prison. So I said to my people, you're afraid of a raised eyebrow? A disparaging comment? We need to put this in comparison with these people who are inviting horrible deaths upon themselves. How are we going to answer the fact that we have been afraid? Not too long ago, it was in the news of these couple, these brave young girls. You'll see a picture of them right there. There was an article recently in World Magazine talk about their story because now they're out, they've been released, and they're now talking about some of, their, uh, some of the things that happened in their life. And I'm going to read just a, a clip from the World Magazine. I wish I could pronounce their names, I cannot. Miriam Rostampur and Marzia Amarazde. I'm sorry. They gained international attention after, attention after their arrest in Tehran in March 2009. Authorities charged the Christian women with apostasy, anti-government activity, and blasphemy. The arrest stemmed from a flurry of Christian activity over three years. The women who met at a conference in Turkey in 2005 had spoken with many others about Christianity. They hosted Bible studies in an apartment they shared near the prison. One Bible study called Mary Magdalene served prostitutes. The pair distributed some 20,000 New Testaments across Tehran and other cities. It's unclear how much Iranian authorities knew about the women's activities, but during a raid on their apartment, they confiscated Bibles and other Christian materials. They pressured the women to cease all Christian activity. They refused, and Amiraz Ezra remembers telling one interrogator, and I quote, unless you cut my tongue out, I will keep feeding the people's hunger for the truth of Jesus. 
They're not like the lion. They are the lion. When I read her answer, it reminded me of Acts chapter 4, where the apostles were caught and they were beaten and they were told, don't you ever talk about this preach in the name of Jesus ever again. And they, verse 18 of, of Acts chapter 4, 4 says, then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, judge for yourselves whether it is right in God's sight to obey you rather than God. For we cannot help speaking about that which we have seen and heard. In another account, they said, we can't stop talking about Jesus. He's like fire. Shut up in my bones. I've got to tell people about Jesus. He's changed my life. The church today makes a lot of big talk and a lot of noise. But when tweak in the nose... We cry like a little girl. It's incomprehensible that people are actually putting up with this kind of abuse and persecution today. But friends, see, here's the deal. You and I living in America, we're not in danger of being torn apart by wild beasts like they were in the times of the arenas and the coliseums. We're not in danger of having our bodies broken at the butts of guns. We are in danger, however, of being hugged to death by the comforts of this world. It encourages us to compromise our convictions as we sit in the comfort of our confessions. Well, I believe, I believe, and you hear people make long lists of all the things they believe. Well, you know something? I'm not interested any longer in what you believe. What do you do? What do you do? Spurgeon once wrote this. I fear that the Christian church is far more likely to lose her integrity in these soft and silken days than in those rougher times. Christianity is in greater danger in these soft and silken days. If you have your Bibles, I'd like to have you turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 13. A fairly well-known passage of Scripture. Friends, ones that you need to understand is the battle of the ages. There's nothing new. You see, today people want to say that Islam is our enemy. Back uh, 20 years ago in the Cold War, it was Russia was our enemy. Today it's liberalism, politicians, godlessness. Friends, you can't put a face to our enemy. Our enemy is of a spiritual nature to do battle against. The Apostle Paul writes, says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Hey, be strong in the Lord. You know, before I had surgery this last January to reattach my bicep, I could bench press 350 pounds. For an old fart, that's pretty strong. I weigh under 200 pounds, and I could bench press 350 at 53 years old. You know what's taken to get that strong? A lot of work over a long period of time. The Bible says, be strong in the Lord. Doesn't that just evoke an interesting question? How strong are you in the Lord? It's one thing to boast about a few memorized scripture verses and boast about how, oh, I've been a Christian for so long. Yeah, but have you, have you been sitting on the couch or have you been spending time in the gym in prayer and working out and interceding for the lost and trying to win the lost and trying to be corrected by the presence of God that's the only way you get stronger. He says, finally, be strong in the Lord. We spend so much time and effort on work, our hobbies, play. I wonder how pitifully weak the church today really is. We like to play games. 
put little stickers on our car, wear nice Christian jewelry, and walk around and try to fool everybody that we got it all together. When inside, Jesus would say, you're full of extortion and dead men's bones. I didn't expect an amen there. Finally, be strong in the Lord. Be strong in the Lord. Wouldn't it be interesting to see how spiritually, how much you could bench press? How strong are you in the Lord? That's an interesting question to pose. Put on the full armor of God so that you may take your stand against the devil's schemes. Friends, you need to realize the enemy is scheming for your attention, for your affection, for your di to diverge you, divert you from what you need to be doing. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God. So that when the day of evil comes, and friends, I'll tell you something, the day of evil is here. It, it, if you're not already dressed, you need to get serious about getting dressed and getting strong. It's not one of these, well, someday uh, I'm going to get back in the gym. Someday I'm going to lose some weight. Someday I'm going to grow spiritually. Someday I'll start my devotions. Someday I'll start that dedicated prayer. Friends, that someday's here. Put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything, to stand. Friends, the picture here, the word picture is incredible. One of battle. One of standing your ground, saying, I'm not going to continue to give up, give up. And the church today just keeps giving up, giving up, giving up. Afraid that somebody's not going to like us. You know, they didn't like Jesus either. In fact, turn with me to Matthew chapter 10. I like the honesty of our master. Our master was so honest. He didn't try to hoodwink people. He didn't try to say, well, you know, if you're, if you, if you're even, if you kind of want to think about God and how he loves you and he's really nice and you don't really have to change much of your life. But if you just accept and see how good God is and if you'll just, and they try to, you know, make it so easy, so many churches today, I, I like, that's not what I see Jesus doing. Jesus said, listen, if you want to be one of my followers, you must deny yourself. Pick up your cross and follow me. See, nobody wants to preach today that you've got to deny yourself. We've got seeker-sensitive churches on every corner. And, and you know something? I don't mean to badmouth that, but if we're just going to continue to tippy-toe around behind any kind of issues, that's exactly the strength we'll have. We'll have a bunch of tippy toe girly boys. As Christians, praise God, we need men that are willing to pull out a sword and start with the judgment on their own lives. Say, so, as for me and my house, start with me. As for me, I'm going to totally surrender my life to Jesus Christ. In Matthew chapter 10, Jesus is so honest. He says, he gives him a word picture that... Back in the farming days, they would have all understood this so clearly because your main job as a shepherd was to protect them from the wolves. He says, I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. Not a pretty picture. You see, I believe that heaven has a sign above it. It says, no wimps allowed. Really, I, I do. I, no wimps allowed. If you want to just be one of those little Christianettes and play Christian games and all that, you know, I, I might have news for you. You might not make it in. Because it says, no wimps allowed. I'm sending you out like sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and innocent as doves. Be on your guard against men. They will hand you over to local synagogues and flog you in their synagogues, their councils and flog you in their synagogues. Friends, here's the deal. 
you and I are not in danger of that right now. But we are, in a sense, being brought before the synagogues of public opinion. We are being brought in radio, TV, pictures, movies, things that we see. We are ridiculed, brought before them to be humiliated. On my account, you will be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. But when they arrest you, do not worry about what you to say and how you are to say it. At that time, you will be given what to say. For it will, not, it will not be you speaking, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. Brother will betray brother to death, and a father is child. Children will rebel, will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. Look at verse 22. You know, there's a lot of people taking verses out of the Bible today. Well, I don't really believe that's for today. You know, I don't care what issue it is, whether it's financial stuff or marriage stuff, whatever. They go, well, that's not really for today. So they take, let's just take some of these verses out. If I was going to start taking verses out of the Bible, I'd start with this one. Okay, here's where I'd start. If it was up to us, just take verses out and say, I don't want that one. I don't like it. He says, all men will hate you because of me. But he who stands firm to the end will be saved. Friends, I, did, I intend to stand firm. I intend to do my job by encouraging you to stand firm. Just like the scarecrow, the church is fun and lovable, but he needs a brain. Just like the tin man is strong and a bulwark of truth in all of, all of our convictions, but we have to have a heart. So too, like the lion, we have the image of being ferocious, the king of all beasts, but we need some courage. The church was never meant to be evolutionary. It was meant to be eternal. The church was never meant to be progressive. It was meant to be pervasive. The church was never meant to be popular. The church was meant to be powerful. The church was never meant to conform, but to transform the lives of everybody hears the words of the preachings of this book. In Matthew chapter 10, we read on, verse 28, it says, Do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but not, cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them falls to the ground apart from the will of your Father. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Whoever acknowledges me before men, I will acknowledge him before my Father in heaven. I don't know about you, but I want to be acknowledging Jesus, my Father, right now on this earth. I want to be acknowledging him before men. You can laugh at me. You can ridicule me. You can laugh, you know, you make fun of me. You can do whatever you want. But there's a day coming when I'm going to look at and see the heavenly Father go, hey, I know you. I know you. Come on in. He says, but whoever disowns me before men, I will disown him before my Father in heaven. Wow. Whoever disowns me. Friends, you know something? Disowning Jesus doesn't just mean, oh, I don't believe in him. Disowning him sometimes is not sticking up for him. Disowning him is remaining silent when you should be vocal. Denying him means doing nothing at times when you should be doing something. Romans chapter 12, verse 2 says, Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Romans chapter 12, verse 21 says, Do not, overcome, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So, when's the last time you can remember you stuck your neck out and you were bold for Jesus? Or are we all like the cowardly lion and we live our life way too safe? Friends, this series, I'm going to continue this part only because I, I really felt impressed. I really want to talk about, okay, if courage is that important, so how do we get it? How do we get courage? 
I'm going to continue this later. How do, you, how do you develop courage? And there's five things that you and I can do to develop courage. Can I just tell you right now what the first one is? I won't explain it. Can I just tell you what it is? It's conviction. If you don't have a conviction, you'll never have any courage. I am convinced that there's one name given under heaven whereby men must be saved. I am convinced, like Jesus said, you must be born again. I am convinced there is a heaven and there is a hell. And that's why I have some courage. Conviction is the first one. And there's four others. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning, we ask your forgiveness. For the times that we have talked big, but we are cowardly. So many times, just like the lion in the Wizard of Oz, we make big boasts and we puff ourselves up and we sound ferocious, but when it comes time to deliver the goods, we're nowhere to be found. Father, we ask your forgiveness. Father, I pray that you would strengthen us. Strengthen us, Lord Jesus, that we would truly be able to join our brothers and sisters around the world that know what it's like to experience persecution. Father, may we be vocal. Father, may we willingly say and agree with you when you ask, will you ride with me? We will say, yes, Lord, we will ride with you. Let's stand.